Thanks so much for having me. My name is uh, Rafa Gomez Bombarelli. I'm an assistant professor in material science at the department of uh, at MIT. And my talk today is going to be about the work we do in representing and optimizing materials with machine learning and about how hyperparameter optimization has become a key part of what we do. I don't think I need to make a big uh, statement that we need new materials and we need them fast. It takes about 20 years since a material is incepted until it makes it into the market. And, uh, you know, sustainability, healthcare, uh, carbon storage, right? There is all these new classes of materials that need to come into the market as soon as we possibly can. Um, and of course, computation has a lot to bring to bear there. There is a number of places, and you know, we all are aware of these, other speakers have referred to this. Um, computers have taken over tasks that used to be exclusive to people, tasks that used to be really hard and require deep expertise. No one goes to a travel agent anymore. Uh, so there were these classes of tasks that have been taken over by computers. And typically we've seen that the clearer the rules are, the easier it is for a computer to, get, to take over. And we've seen that with the advances in algorithms, in the scale of the uh, data that we have, in the hardware that we use for these operations, um, computers have increasingly uh, outperformed people. And of course, the question that comes in this context is, how does this look for material science and engineering, right? How do we invent new materials using computers? And of course, this is something that people have been doing for, for a while now, uh, but what, what is the tipping point? How does this AI supremacy look like? Um, and one of the first questions, of course, that comes with that is whether we want to outperform the best person ever at this, right? Like, like in the Go game, or we just want to commoditize tasks that used to be really hard and really expensive, and they become instantaneous and, uh, and just very efficient to do in a computer. Um, like I said, there is explicit rules sometimes uh, in, in the physical sciences, right? We do have laws that are kind of universal and, and allow us to extrapolate. Um, but we also have data that is typically sparse and domain specific. And uh, we postulate, right, that the computers can help across this continuum. I, I don't think there's a lot of uh, computational uh, scientists, uh, physical scientists in the audience, so I, I won't dive too deep into this, but uh, we postulate that there is a continuum between the physics, the first principle simulations that are uh, great because they extrapolate, they hold universally, uh, as long as, as we put in the right physics that we know should be happening, uh, but they're typically expensive to simulate. And like I said, if we don't know what the nature of a phenomenon is, then we can't really use this tool. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, there is sort of machine learning and data science, right? And there is this big uh, set of algorithms that have really worked very, very well in other domains uh, that leverage these big data sets that are pretty much uh, black box, that have shown uncanny performance. And of course, AlphaFold is, is a huge example in the physical sciences, right? A task that seemed to be absolutely uh, impossible a few years back has been solved through data and you know, some understanding of the phenomenon, but mostly through, through algorithmic uh, innovations in learning. Uh, and our group works precisely in this continuum, right? In this line that connects the first principles to the machine learning and trying to mix them up in the most effective way. So, uh, so they sort of feed off of each other and we increase the robustness of machine learning and we reduce the data needs of machine learning uh, through the first principles. And the first way that this applies to us is in what we call end-to-end -end representation learning. So the first example of this is uh, how do we input matter into machine learning algorithms, right? Uh, traditionally, this has been called structural property relationships in the physical sciences. This is how do I connect the structure of a material, the structure of a molecule with its properties, uh, and its mirror image in, the, in learning is uh, representation learning, right? What is the type of transformations that we need to apply to our raw input uh, so that it becomes a vector that we can do uh, learning over? Um, traditional approaches have worked well at this uh, to some degree, uh, particularly because data sets were typically small and, and not as big as, as the places where one uses deep learning typically. But as we've moved into, into the last few years, the libraries have become big enough 
where we can try to do representation learning over the full uh, chemical space and, uh, and abandon honey engineer features, just like machine vision community did uh, years ago, where they moved to, you know, just convolutional neural networks that are really deep and learn to process pixels all the way up to full images. Um, we can do the same thing over atoms. And the architecture that does this uh, for matter these days is uh, graph convolutional neural networks. Uh, you've got a little diagram there. Essentially, they aggregate information uh, across local graph environments such that they learn how to represent every atom optimally for a given task, right? So it's an end-to-end -end process where the local representations are optimized for a given task based on aggregating local information in a way that scales really nicely and gets to capture something that in physics, right, we call locality, that typically uh, most of the effect comes from, uh, from local environments and it's not really too long range. So this is the state of the art architecture um, that we use, for instance, to predict the color of a molecule, right? So this is, this is something that is uh, very, very visual. Uh, it is possible to calculate with physics what color a molecule is going to be. Uh, and that's really important, for instance, to make solar cells. That's important to make uh, medical imaging dyes, right? It's important for a type of uh, uh, medical therapies that are called phototherapies, where the interaction of, of a molecule with light helps, you know, diagnose or helps treat a disease. So it's really important to be able to predict what a molecule's color is. And uh, you can see in that the regression plot on the left that physics is good at this. There is there's a technique called time-dependent density functional theory uh, that has an error of about 25 nanometers. And you know that's pretty much the difference between two successive colors in the rainbow. You know, the difference between red and orange is about 20 nanometers, and the difference between orange and yellow is about 20 nanometers. So physics gets you like let's say plus minus one color in the rainbow. Uh, so this is a place where we've used uh, an architecture, a multi-fidelity graph neural network that uh, straight up tries to predict the outcome of the physical simulation from the, from the molecular structure. And that gives us some regularization and some generalizability, thanks to what I just said, that physics, we can do as much physics as we want, right? Experiments are expensive, but these simulations are about 100 to 1,000 times cheaper than actually making a molecule and testing it. So, we can cast a much wider base. Um, and through this multi-fidelity approach, we've managed to get to about uh, seven nanometers. Uh, so this is, we hit the color, right? We maybe don't get the hue perfect, but we know if, if a molecule is going to be orange or it's going to be red or it's going to be yellow, uh, thanks to integrating uh, physics-based simulation plus uh, representation learning end-to-end -end in a single stack. Uh, where does the you know the uh, hyperparameter optimization come in here? Well, this is this is a constant in my group, right? We we take a new task that has something to do with matter. Uh, at the beginning, nothing works, right? The students are plugging pieces together and, and things don't work. Then it finally works. They're, they're back propagating all the way end to end, and they're finally training. And you know the models don't do really don't do too well. This, this happens every time. It finally plugs in, but the performance is not great. And it's, we always do the same. Like now it's become a hyperparameter problem and we just take a step back and let the machine solve it. So I'm going to show a couple of examples like this. Uh, you can see the first experiment we did with sort of a random uh, default parameters from graph convolutions was 50 nanometers. So that was worse than the theory. That's like two and a half colors over the rainbow. Uh, and then it slowly improves and then gets us to this 25, 30, which is like I said, the same as the physics based uh, simulation on its own. And then finally goes to less than 20, right? This 10 value that I was saying is hitting the right color. So this is the place where, you know, we can take a step back, let the hyperparameter optimization figure out what settings we should do. These are typically new models for new tasks. So there is very little intuition about hyperparameters, what stride, right? How many atoms to convolve together? All these things haven't really in a standardized, there isn't a huge community pushing this every day in a way that, that everybody builds intuitions about the models. So it's really helped us to just be able to plug it somewhere and, and you know, take a step back and just see whether we can disentangle, right, the architectural choices where we innovate from the fine tuning 
that finally makes the, the performance comes out. I've got a couple more examples. Uh, this is on therapeutics. There's a class of therapeutics that are called peptides um, that are really excellent for, among other things, uh, delivering biological therapeutics into the cell. So there, are, there is a class of biological therapeutics that are important for diseases uh, uh, that are really devastating, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, whose patients you know, have a life expectancy of, of under 30. And there is a therapy that can help with that, uh, but it really struggles to hit the biological place where it needs to go inside the cell. It's, it's a big therapeutic uh, macromolecule that, that really struggles to be carried into the cell. So these cell-penetrating uh, peptides can be attached to the therapeutics, be carried to, to help carry into the cell, right? And there are assays that can quantify how good a cell-penetrating peptide is. And, and this robot you see here is an automated synthesizer from a collaborator that gets to make uh, peptides with it and, and systematically uh, quantifies how good they are at delivering these biological payloads. So this is a design problem that uh, essentially needs to explore uh, the combinations of 20 amino acids, so maybe a few more than 20 if, if we're allowed to use artificial chemistries, which in our case we are, uh, to find the optimal, the most performing one, right? So we, we need to have this combinatorial space of 20 to the length of the peptide, which can be 30, 40, 50, that's more than atoms on the earth, uh, and find the best one. So what we do for that is we train another class of representation learning algorithms, here we leverage the sequential nature of the peptide uh, with a 1D convolution, and then we created one uh, encodings for each monomer based on their chemoinformatics fingerprint, based on this traditional, right? Here we're not doing representation learning end-to-end -end because we don't have enough data. So we just use traditional representations uh, for every monomer in the sequence, and then string together all these uh, individual monomers into a sequence representation for the full peptide, and then apply 1D convolutions for that. So again, some architectural choices to do representation learning, and, and a whole class of models that we don't really know, you know what are the settings that make them work. Um, and in this case, you can see that histogram to the top right, every peptide we invented with this algorithm was better than the best in the training data. Uh, so this was a one-shot experiment. We, we didn't do active learning. We just did it once. And out of the, the 14 we predicted, two were uh, uh, negative controls, and 12 were better than the best ha that had been ever made um, based on this ability to learn over uh, macromolecular representations. And again, this was an example where it's a new class of models, a new class of tasks. We don't really know what we should do fine, to fine tune it. And you can see, again, the student at the, at the beginning, they started, and, and this was as good as a random forest. So not very good. Uh, and through just, you know, taking a step back and letting the machine run and, and tell us, you know, automatically iterate over the experiments we should be running, uh, we were able to hit the state of the art and to predict better than, than any other model. And, and you can see validate experimentally in the lab and in animals uh, what the best therapeutic peptides could be for this. Uh, this is something that is a generalization of this tool that I just described, um, uh, which is you know, going to be presented at a NURIPS uh, workshop uh, in a few weeks at the Learning Meaningful Representations of Life, where we work with a class of macromolecules that are graphs themselves, right? So we have a polymer graph of monomers, which are also you know, molecular graphs. So we have this stacked representation uh, that we need to figure out. And, and we brought our two tools together, right? We did uh, graph convolutions at the polymer level, at the intermonomer connections, and we use chemoinformatic representations again for every monomer because there's about a thousand of them. It's not enough to drive representation learning on its own. And again, this hybrid chemoinformatic monomer description plus um, deep learning representation for the full peptide is again once again the state of the art for property prediction in this class of, uh, of macromolecules that are called glycans or uh, oligosaccharides um, that are important for you know therapeutics they're important for cell regulation and they're important for toxicity some of the biggest toxins out there 
uh, when you get food poisoning are, are glycans. And we were able to get very good at property prediction and we were able to get good at um, attribution because these models are differentiable end to end. We could go back uh, and do attribution over which parts of the polymer are responsible for the toxicity. Right? So we were able to interrogate the neural network and tell us, well, what do you think is the reason why this polymer is particularly toxic? And uh, the answer was uh, these monomers that are uh, alien to humans, right? They only they all exist in, in non-human animals and in non-human species, which is it's an obvious reason, right? That, that it's very easy for the body to identify that this a non-human building block is is extraneous and and uh, give an immune response to that. So then attribution was able to tell us that back. And uh, again, this is one of the others. It wasn't really a state of the art because we were the, the first people to do this uh, for this particular application. But again, you can see that, that we get these discrete hops in performance that really move the, the needle from sort of this baseline. Uh, we, we didn't know what we were doing to a much better performance. That, that is what allows us to sort of ask, answer the actual questions that we care about, right? In a sense, we don't care about the hyperparameters. What we really care about is getting these models to invent or to attribute something useful. So everything I've talked so far has been about us screening, right? So we make a forward model that is uh, accurate and predictive, and then we run it over a long list of candidates, right? That's 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 called screening in, in our parlance, uh, and it's related, like I said, to property prediction, right? So if somebody produces an input, we predict. Uh, what the output is for the property we care about. And that's great, but that's not actually the task I set out to, to solve at the beginning when I said, we need new materials. But ideally, what we want is the computer to help us do the opposite task. I right? want the computer to help us design for a target property. So given my desired property, what is the material that fulfills it? Right? So it's, it's an inverse problem. Um, it might not be bijective, right? There, there are big challenges to this, but in truth, what we're trying to solve is this, right? It's condition on, on the property I want. What is the arrangement of matter that will give me that, if, if that's even possible? And this relates, this, this paper keeps getting older and older. It's 2018 now, and it still looks amazing. Um, this relates to generative tasks, right? This, this borrows and, and is inspired and parallel by generative models in machine learning, well, well, what we're trying to do is to sample members of a complex distribution, right? Only the distribution this time is not the distribution of celebrity faces. Now we want to sample from the distribution of molecules to find a molecule that is the deepest, uh, more color pure blue to make the blue pixel in your TV, right? That's, that's the nature of the task. And the architecture that do this, and look like they're doing good at this, uh, are generative models. So back in, uh, in 2015, 2016, we started playing around with the variational autoencoders. And that was one of the first examples where one could do this. Right? We take a molecule, we encode it as a, as a vector. So we get this graph to vector, right? And now it's a, a continuous vector. We can uh, numerically modify it, right? We can do gradient descent over property prediction. Uh, we can sample from the distribution at random and learn to decode all of these molecules back into the input. Right? So we set up a variational autoencoder architecture that learns to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct an, an input into, into its own uh, image at the output. And in the meantime, learns this uh, embedding, this continuous embedding, uh, where every latent point corresponds to a molecule, not just the ones we've seen at train, but it learns to generalize and produce new molecules that are related, right? They come from the same distribution of the, as the training data. They're related to the training data. They have sort of the same distribution of properties, uh, but they're new, right? They haven't been made yet. Just like the celebrity faces that I showed earlier didn't correspond to any person. So this type of architecture allows us to invent new molecules. And if we manage to know what latent points map to which properties, we can then do numerical optimization, right? Optimizing molecules is hard because you need to decide which atom connects with, with 
with each other. And there's lots of rules for that. But using a generative model allows us to implicitly learn all those rules, make sure we're sampling from the correct distribution, and just focus on finding the right properties through, through numerical optimization. And this is something that did well uh, back, in, back in the first examples. So here you see aspirin, the molecule of aspirin uh, on the left in blue, and then all the others are slightly distorted versions of aspirin uh, dreamt by the computer, right? So we get aspirin and we encode it as a numerical vector. We add a little bit of noise, numerical noise to it, right? We sample from a, from a Gaussian and, and add a little bit of numerical noise to the aspirin vector. And then we decode back into new molecules. And we get these molecules that kind of share a lot of the chemical features with, of aspirin, right? We've, we've taken numerical noise and it, we've transformed it back into chemical noise, right? And, and we've learned to make all these tiny, tiny variations around aspirin. So if we were looking for a molecule that had similar properties to aspirin. Now we, we're in the same manifold, uh, but we can get to pick which one is slightly better for, for the task that we were after. And in the last couple of years, we've been very interested in how does this look for solids, right? So molecules and solids are not the same thing. Molecules are typically a graph. It's, it's enough to know the connectivity to generate new molecules. Uh, but here we're trying to generate lattices, right? So crystals and solids are made from a periodic arrangement of atoms in three dimensions, right? Which every atom occupies a point in a, in a Bravais lattices, in a, in a uh, infinitely repeating three-dimensional pattern. Uh, so it's a, a lot more three-dimensional, but it's not a strictly three-dimensional because uh, the positions in a lattice are, uh, like I said, fixed by a prototype and an assignment. Right? You can see that example that I'm showing there from a material that's called a, a perovskite. Uh, and you can see how the uh, material is fully defined, even though I haven't written the size of A and B and C, right? These vectors are not, I don't need to fully say what the distances are uh, just to get the relative arrangements, right? So I need a, a machine learning algorithm, I need a way to sample lattices uh, that respects all the symmetries of the lattices. So it should have translational symmetry, it should have a, a rotational symmetry, um, and has some 3D features, but, but not uh, all the way to just making cloud points. And uh, something we've done here is autoregressive models. Uh, so essentially, if you're familiar with this, right, autoregressive models uh, sample, in our case, for a lattice, which atom is going to be on every side of the lattice, right? So it will start from, a, from an initial one and then condition on the value it pulled, it will continue assigning uh, lattice elements, right? So uh, this is how we can populate, right? Imagine if a material, like I said, is a lattice uh, of atoms, then our assignment problem is what element, you know, should, be, should this be lanthanum? Should this be uh, iron? Should, should this be cobalt? So we need a machine and an algorithm that populates which element uh, should sit at every side of the lattice to optimize the property that we want, right? So we still need a forward model, but we also need a clever way to navigate this design space to maximize the property that we want and to minimize the energy of the material, right? Because while typically it's possible to make molecules that are not stable, it's really hard to make materials that are not stable because the way they're made uh, as solids at high temperatures typically means that, that thermodynamics, just sheer stability of the material dominates the, the process. So again, we're, we're at a very similar flavor where we have this uh, new task that you know hasn't, hasn't received much attention. It's, it's autoregressive. It's over a lattice, which is not a, a, a typical data structure in, in machine learning. Um, and, you know, it needs to, to satisfy that it finds low energy, high property configurations. And by populating, like I said, sequentially, which element uh, should sit at which uh, lattice site. Um, and a classical example for this is the ESIM model. If, if anybody in the audience took some, some physics uh, back in, the, uh, in their studies, and you'll be familiar with this. These are spin models. These are two-dimensional lattices where every site interacts uh, only with its first uh, nearest neighbors. But that's already enough physics to have uh, phase transitions, uh, spatial correlation, 
and a lot of really complicated emergent physics. So we've trained models that learn to sample the right distribution of states in an, in an easy model, right? That, you know, you set up a temperature and they produce samples that correspond to the right temperature efficiently. So it's, it's autoregressive, but they produce uncorrelated samples. And uh, you can see there at the top right, uh, different a size model, so an 8 by 8, a 16 by 16, and a 32 by 32 model. And at the critical temperature, that is exactly the phase transition temperature between order and disorder, uh, you can see that they produce qualitatively meaningful, you should have 50-50 distribution, you have long uh, length correlation. So uh, visually, the properties of, of, the, uh, of the samples that we produce from this IC model are all relevant. And uh, if, you know, eyeballing is, is not proof enough for you, of course, uh, we can also see in that uh, middle plot there with the color dots and lines um, that the model learns to predict the phases with the same free energy as rigorous one Landau sampling. So we can go back to classical ways of sampling from this distribution of states, producing these uh, lattices in a, in a completely rigorous manner. And we can see that the machine learning models of days uh, about uh, one order of magnitude less compute um, and produces equally good uh, samples across a temperature range. Right? So this, this is the tool that allows us to place atoms on a lattice in a way that they maximize something. You can see in the bottom plot that this has rotational symmetry, luckily, right? that the model learned to assign the same likelihood at the same energy to two rotated frames. Um, but again, this is a task that uh, hadn't been really done before. And we have no idea what the weights should be and the parameters should be uh, to, to optimize this. So this plot is slightly different. I'm showing the free energy, the error in the free energy, right? So we should, should go to zero at the end, uh, starting from, a, from a, a negative value. And again, we started off in a place that was was, wasn't helpful, right? Was completely useless. And then the optimization was able to find these two or three critical changes in the architecture of the model uh, to get us to the performance level that allows us to, again, answer scientific questions of these models, uh, which is what we set out to do. So in summary, uh, I will say, and I hope, you know, it, I've, I've gone fast through a number of examples, but I hope I've, I've conveyed to you that uh, machine learning and the physical science interplay to invent new materials, and that the uh, that this interplay means that these are architectures and, and tasks that are relatively new, uh, and it's very hard to build intuitions about the hyperparameter selections. You know, how many layers in message passing do I do error? Do I do uh, edge message passing or just node message passing? There is all this decisions that are unintuitive uh, and the community hasn't built a lot of understanding for them and they're the perfect place for hyperparameter optimization where having a service where we just send the model uh, send the, hype, the selection of hyperparameters and keep iterating until until they work and in our experience in many many projects it has been the difference between our architectures being worse than the baseline to our architecture being the state of the art by just fine tuning the, the hyperparameters in the architectures. Uh, so with this, I will just, you know, uh, thank our sponsors uh, and thank uh, uh, the team and you for your attention.